All right, so here's the uh, assignments for module five. These uh, first three uh, questions, um, it's really just more about definition. So I just I just put them on one slide because there's no math involved. Um, and so I just we're going to use free cash flow a lot. So the, the first one is just to make sure you understand uh, what we're talking about, um, you know, um, and it's, excuse me, um, uh, the cost of capital um, is going to depend uh, on the use of the funds, uh, not the source of the funds, right? So the, the requirement that we're going to have um, is going to, based on that. All right, here in uh, question four, let's read through the question real quick. Uh, you see question A, we ask, uh, what is the required return? Uh, we were told what the risk-free rate was. The T-bill rate is risk-free. Uh, we were told the beta uh, of the stock. And then uh, we were told the market risk premium, right? The expected risk premium on the market is 6%. So that's the difference between the return on the market and the risk-free. That's what risk premium means. Uh, so we can calculate what the required return uh, based on that beta and that market condition. And then in B, what's the company's cost of capital, right? And this has to do with the relationship between debt and equity and how much we have to pay for debt versus the cost of equity. And so the return on our assets, which is what our cost of capital uh, is, uh, would be the 8.49%. And then again, if you were to change uh, your beta, that's going to change your required return. <coughs> Excuse me. The so question five, uh, you know, the company has uh, debt, right? That they've gone out and, uh, and taken on and then they funded the rest of their company uh, with equity. Right, we know that the interest rate is nine percent, but they also have a tax rate of thirty-five percent, and the uh, taxes will shelter uh, that a bit. Um, and then we have an interest rate uh, that we have to meet plus our uh, market risk premium, um, and then we have the uh, the beta uh, of the stock. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're weighting what percentage of our company is debt and what percentage of our company is uh, equity. And that's one that's the weighted average cost because it's not 50-50. In this case, it's 48% and 52%. But all we're doing is uh, coming up with what it costs us in capital uh, based on the, uh, excuse me, the uh, prevailing interest rate uh, our beta and also the uh, uh, rate that we're paying uh, for our uh, debt. Uh, this one shows um, the estimate of risk, right? And you notice there's the standard deviation, which we've used a lot uh, when we're talking about risk. Uh, you also see R squared, right? And, and what that R squared is saying how much does X explain Y, right? So R squared could get all the way to one um, in theory, right? And if the R squared was one, then it's perfectly explains it, right? This would be like a straight line, you know? Um, but the better it explains it, the closer it gets to one, the lower it explains it, the, the closer it is to zero. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's what's introducing with that. Beta we, we've seen before. And then standard error of beta, uh, what it's saying is there's some uh, variance around that. And then if you notice, um, when we get to uh, co coming up with uh, 
uh, specific variance, right? And, and question B, right? So we're going to calculate the, the variance and specific variance. What is that? We're, we're trying to pull apart how much of it is the market. And that's the stuff that we can't get rid of. You can't use the market to get rid of market risk. Uh, but what we uh, can do is use the market to get rid of my company risk, the idiosyncratic, the things unique to that one uh, company. Um, and so that's what they're, they try to pull out is, okay, how much of this variance is the market? That's where our R squared is, is telling us, you know, how well is the market explaining things and how much of it's other stuff. Right. Um, and so that's uh, what they're, they're talking about in that one. Uh, creating the confidence intervals in C. Um, when we, uh, in this one, um, for the, the 95% uh, uh, confidence interval, uh, they're saying two standard deviations. Now, technically, 95% uh, confidence is 1.96. Um, uh, but yeah, so the uh, two is, uh, is, is what they're having you use uh, for this one. It's close. It's you know it works. It's 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 actually closer to like ninety six percent confidence if you if you use two standard deviations. But um, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, but you would just put in what the the mean value is and then plus or minus two times uh, the standard deviation of it. Like they call it the standard error on this. One. But uh, that's all it is. You know the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. Uh, question D talks about cap M. So remember with that one, uh, we expect, um, you know, the return on a some sort of investment is going to be equal to the risk free plus beta times that, that market risk premium. Um, and so that's what you're seeing with this. Um, and then E, um, you know, again, just saying, okay, if all this holds uh, and next year the market does this, what would their return be? Okay, and this one is is three problems that were very related. Let's put them together. Uh, so the first one, uh, we're just trying to calculate what the the beta would be. Uh, and on this one, it's it's a little bit different because we normally talk about beta being the um, a company's uh, like stock with the market. Uh, but this one, we're just pulling apart just to the asset piece, right? And uh, so just using um, you know, the, the weights that we have and then what those betas are, we can um, add that to come up with what the overall beta is. Basically, it's as if it were a, a portfolio of assets, right? And these assets have this beta, these other assets have this beta. Based on these weights that you have between those, what's your overall beta? So, um, and then the, the dividend growth model, right? P sub zero equals D sub one divided by R minus G, right? Or P sub zero would be equal to D sub zero times one plus G, right? If we have to use the same time period, but uh, normally this time period's price is based on next time period's dividend. Um, and so uh, it's basically just some some algebra, right? So uh, that's what that one is. And then uh, that third one there, um, ABC Corp is paying a dividend um, and this is the current price. Uh, you have uh, estimate that this is the the G right in that uh, what is R right and so it's like rearranging as we did in that previous one and then uh, you would just solve for what that R is given the dividend given the price uh, and given the growth this one uh, it's just a little bit trickier I guess because we have to use next year remember uh, we just got uh, if they said they just paid a dividend of six dollars. I need to know what the next one's going to be, right? And so I just have to grow that up at that 6%. All right, here's question 10, right? And it's the same type of thing with the risk-free plus beta times that market risk premium. So we, we worked a few of these problems already. Uh, question 11, um, you know, has this uh, word problem. I'll let you read through that real quick.
And then um, you notice um, in A, right, if you agree to this fixed price contract, your operating leverage is going to increase, right? Because I've got, I've built this in now, right? And so any changes in revenue will result in greater changes in profit, right? Because what happens is I've locked in one piece, right? And so the other ones, when they move, it's going to proportionally be larger because this piece is locked in. And then you can calculate what the value is with and without the contract. And this fixed and variable cost is something we're going to get into later, uh, you know, looking at uh, the best way to structure um, your, your organization. Is it, is it better to have higher fixed costs or higher variable costs? All right, and then this one, uh, if you notice, uh, it's basically just introduce this risk and just say, okay, there is some probability uh, that you, uh, you know, have this coup d'etat uh, and you don't get your contract, right? And uh, with current events in the last year, you probably understand how, you know, geopolitical events can happen. You're just running your business, doing normal things, and suddenly, you know, things are going to change, right? And so... Um, this is this is what we uh, what we have going on in this situation. Um, they're saying, is it proper uh, to use forty percent as the discount rate? And it's like, well, no, we've already come up with what the the discount rate the the controller wanted to use fifty percent. Um, normally, we would use twelve percent. Um, and then how how much is that two twenty if the odds of the coup d'état are twenty five percent? So there's twenty five percent chance we get nothing. Right, and then the remaining uh, seventy-five percent chance that we do get our two hundred twenty thousand dollars next year, right? So we calculate what that's worth today or worth next year, and then we would calculate what's the present value today at our twelve percent cost of capital of one hundred sixty-five thousand next year. In this problem, um, all we're doing is calculating uh, the present value of a project. But like they give us the cash flow in year one and year two. They tell us the interest rate. Uh, they tell us that the risk premium in the market is this. They tell us the beta, right? And so uh, first off, we'd calculate what is our cost of equity, right? Well, we have our beta. Uh, we're given a, a market risk premium. Uh, and we're given a risk-free rate, the interest rate, right? So... Uh, use that, we can calculate what our uh, equity requirements are, and that would tell us the present value of those two cash flows, right? One we get next year, one in two years, right? And then what is the certainty equivalent, right? It's like, okay, well, if I had no risk, right, uh, what would that be, right? What is $117 in one year worth today if there is no risk to that? Right. Um, and so uh, in our case, that ends up being one hundred and ten dollars and then one hundred and thirteen for one hundred and twenty eight in two years. Right. Uh, and then what's that ratio? Basically, it gives you a measure uh, of how sensitive you are. Uh, you're more sensitive on that year two win than you are in the year one. This is an unusual concept, but it's really just looking at a, a product, right? And so what we're going to do is launch. So we're going to spend a lot of money, right, to get things started. Um, uh, and then once we, you know, get that going and we're going to go out and uh, let everybody try it, if it looks like it's going to be good, then we go ahead, spend even more money, right, to go out and, uh, and, and set up all the machinery and everything we would need to do. Uh, or we just kill it, right? And that happens, right? Companies try new things 
market responds poorly, they dump they dump it. If the market responds well, they go ahead and uh, and, and expand. Right? And so that's all we're doing here. Uh, and so we're saying, okay, what would the present value be if we decide to launch? Uh, and then we decide what's the present value today with the possibility that we never launch. And so that's uh, that's what we come up with there. And because we do have this net present value that's positive, that's when we would go ahead and try it with the understanding that it's possible it won't make money, right? But we expect it to, but there's obviously the possibility it won't. Okay, and this problem's a little long. There's a, actually an A, B, and a C. So I just have A and B on this slide, uh, but it's going to use the same information. Uh, and this is looking at nominal versus real. If you remember the Irving Fisher equation, um, you know, for that um, part A, um, you know, deals with that piece. Uh, part B, we're calculating the net present value of those earlier wells, right, given in the problem. Right, so we have to discount. We know what our discount rate is, the real rate, right? And we also know um, what that uh, premium is, right? Because it says the oil company proposes to add 20 percentage points uh, to offset the risk, right? And so with those, both of these projects uh, have negative NPVs. Right, and then this, are they uh, the correct NPVs? Um, you know, and then if they are correct, uh, then put that in, uh, if they're incorrect, calculate what it should be. And, uh, we shouldn't be putting that extra 20%, right? Uh, so like that's, um, uh, so if you just say, look, it's, well, what is it really, you know, what, what do we calculate, uh, our discount rate to appropriately be that 11.4% in, in this case, uh, what's the NPV? And so that's that's what those are. So that's all of the uh, chapter nine questions. Uh, moving on to chapter ten. Uh, first of all, these you know there's not math involved, so I went ahead and put those on the same one. Um, and just understand this uh, chapter ten is going to have a lot more of looking at what are variable costs, which are going to be a function of the number of units, the quantity, the Q, right? Uh, and then the fixed costs, right? The more you have in fixed costs, uh, the larger you want your runs to be, right? You want to scale those costs out over as much as possible. If you have high variable costs, you don't get those economies of scale, uh, but you give up uh, a lot of downside risk, right? With fixed costs, you're on the hook to pay that whether you get sales or not. Uh, with variable costs, that would be like a commission. And if you don't get the sales, I don't have to pay you, right? Um, and so... As a company, we, we have to balance, uh, you know, this fixed variable. And then here are questions four, five, and six. <coughs> and again, the, the break even is going to be another thing we address in here. That's how we're going to come up with our uh, fixed and variable. Uh, what? How many units do we think we're going to sell? What's that compared to break even? Uh, you know, and, and go from there. All right, chapter seven. Here we have this uh, burger place that's going to produce four million hamburgers. We know what the cost is. If we go up to 8 million, this is what the cost is. So we have two different numbers, right? The 4 million and then the 8 million, right? If they double production, their costs go up an additional 1.3 million, right? So we can calculate what is the fixed variable on that. And then uh, what's the average cost per burger if you had 2 million burgers, right? And then what would be the average cost at 4 million, right? And so you can see... Uh, between C and D, how uh, those fixed costs are just get scaled out over more and more. Now, it doesn't do anything about the the variable cost, like the, the hamburger meat itself, but there's fixed costs, perhaps using more machines and fewer humans, right? That kind of thing um, that would uh, be able to scale it out as we have more units sold. All right, here's questions uh, eight, nine, and 10, right? 
So just go ahead and, and look over that. Um, question nine, that operating cash flow. We've, we've dealt with this um, uh, before, but we, we haven't done it with uh, price versus quantity and then the variable cost per unit and, and things like that. But it's, it's the same type of calculation that we do. Um, it just, uh, instead of using sort of like a financial statement analysis, this is using uh, the operation production. Um, so when I worked in manufacturing, uh, this this was like a, a more common way of like cost accounting uh, and that kind of thing um, to determine uh, how many units we needed to push. Uh, this isn't a dig on anybody here currently working in that type of, of environment, but uh, we would always joke that the salespeople can always sell units uh, a lot uh, cheaper than it costs for us to make them, right? Basically saying, uh, of course, it's easy to sell if we're losing money on it. Um, and so that's just one of those uh, things that we always have to keep up with is making sure we're properly accounting uh, for what it costs for us to uh, you know, put out units. Uh, here's question 11, right? And just what this is trying to get at is, do you understand what's happening with, with your profitability as sales change, right? Um, and so, you know, we're based on, uh, you know, a certain level of sales. What, what happens if sales are not 6.3, but only 5.5. And then later, what if it goes up as high as 7.1? All right. Finally, this is question 12, right? Um, and so this is just a look at like that degree of operating leverage, uh, deconstructed a bit with the, uh, uh, the, the information that's given to us, um, you know, let you see how it, that looks when, when laid out side by side, uh, with the two levels of sales, 7,840 versus 13,720. As always, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to, to email me and ask. I'm sorry, the uh, the weather has really gotten to me. That's why I don't have much of a voice. Uh, ho hopefully this was clear, though. Thank you.